All right, this is uh, lecture one for uh, microbiology. Um, we'll have a whole series of lectures uh, through the semester. Um, uh, each lecture may take uh, more than one uh, uh, file. Um, uh, so I'll have lecture one, part one, lecture one, part two, perhaps, we'll see. I'll try to keep the um, uh, videos to 30 to 40 minutes long, but sometimes I go, I lose track of the time, I go a little longer. But nevertheless, uh, it should be clear by the name what the order is. So I'll have lecture one, part one, lecture one, part two, etc. Uh, that's just an example. I think <clears throat> perhaps uh, more than likely I can get through this particular one in. Uh, 30 to 40 minutes easily. Okay, so uh, first of all, I should tell you I consider microbiology uh, one of the most important uh, topics uh, for people who are in healthcare because uh, if you are ignorant of anything about microorganisms, then you can cause an awful lot of. Um, problems for your co-workers, your patients, and your families. Um, you need to have a feeling and an understanding for microorganisms and how infection occurs. Clearly a, um, clearly a contemporary uh, uh, topic. Um, anyhow, microorganisms are in general the microorganisms we study. In general, these are things that are too small to be seen with the unaided eye. They need to be observed under the microscope. Although I should add that traditionally parasites are also included in um, the study of micro uh, microbiology. So, and those can sometimes be quite large. The term germ refers to a rapidly growing cell, but uh, is rarely used. It's the kind of word that's used more by the public, uh, germ, ailment, um, illness, you know. Um, let's move on. The major kinds of organisms that are studied in uh, microbiology, microorganisms, include bacteria, fungi, protists or protozoa, and protozoa is the older name but is still very commonly used and I, I'm sure I'll use it more often than protists, protozoa. Uh, viruses and uh, algae actually are included in microorganisms. They have an incredibly wide range of functions and, and potential uses. These are, this is sort of a grab all general listing of vague, very vague, very introductory listing of some of the things that microorganisms are capable of. In general, they do decompose organic waste. Uh, they Some can act as primary producers in ecosystems. By primary, we mean that they directly fix uh, energy from uh, light, uh, the sun source, so by photosynthesis. Uh, some are used to, in production of uh, chemicals at an industrial scale, for example, ethyl alcohol produced uh, by yeast. Um, in fact, is produced by, um, well, it's a yeast, which falls under the category of fungus. Acetone also is produced by microorganisms. All the fermented foods, and that includes vinegar, cheese, bread, yogurt, pickles, all of that. And there's many different kinds of fermented foods that are eaten worldwide. All of those are brought to you courtesy of microorganisms. They're also used in uh, different manufacturing processes. They produce, they can produce cellulase, the source of cellulase for used for breaking down uh, cellulose uh, in pulp and paper production. And by via biotechnology, they're used for producing uh, recombinant DNA products where the gene is isolated from an organism, a in treatment of humans, for example, it's the genes isolated from uh, human DNA and inserted into a microorganism that can produce it in large quantities. And insulin and erythropoietin can be produced this way, although uh, 
I must say that um, these aren't the greatest examples. Originally, it, they were produced in microorganisms, but it's hard to get rid of all the contaminants. So now they typically put genes into uh, mammalian cells uh, that can be grown in culture. Nevertheless, biotechnology products are produced certainly by uh, microorganisms receiving DNA from recombinant DNA from uh, other organisms. Now, there are more microorganisms out there in the environment than we know exactly. Nobody's sure. There are the vast majority probably have not been identified um, because the only way to identify a microorganism is to grow it in pure culture um, to a large number and um, many cannot easily at all be grown in uh, in the lab and so we know based on um, based on DNA sequencing of samples that there are many uh, microorganisms out there uh, which have not been uh, identified, grown and identified in the lab, far more than probably are known and have been identified. Of all the microorganisms, and there are many that have been identified, only a very, very few actually are pathogenic. In other words, they can only a very small number can cause disease in humans. <clears throat> now, once some, the, a particular microorganism is understood, once it can be studied, it uh, uh, essentially the problems associated with any particular microorganism, uh, once it's, uh, the organism is fully understood, then uh, it allows humans to do one of two things. Uh, one is uh, if it's involved in, in food spoilage, we can prevent food spoilage by uh, eliminating it if we understand it and know about it. And the other is that we can prevent disease from occurring in humans if we know and understand the particular microorganism that causes a particular type of infectious disease. Uh, the food spoilage side of things is actually extremely important uh, in uh, in terms of um, economics, uh, because uh, it's a huge problem in uh, food production, but also in terms of the history of microbiology, because the very first um, advances, the very beginning of understanding of uh, bacteriology and microorganisms came from the food industry, uh, because it was supporting scientists who are looking into how to prevent food spoilage, spoilage of wine production, spoilage of uh, beer production, which was tremendously costly and they didn't know what was going on. And so they supported uh, scientists who eventually in the 1800s uh, came up with the germ theory and understanding of bacteriology. Um, and this led to the establishment of aseptic techniques to prevent contamination. And that's important both in medicine and in labs and in health and in food production, all of that. <clears throat> now, uh, we don't jump into disease. We start off by explaining the basics about microorganisms. And once you know some of the basics, then you're uh, you will be better prepared to understand uh, the disease causing problems that occur and the uh, fundamental characteristics of, uh, of uh, pathogenesis to uh, pathogenic mechanisms caused by different types of microorganisms. So we start off with uh, just the naming, very simple. It's an introductory course in microbiology. So we just start off with the idea of naming, classifying microorganisms. It was first established by Linnaeus uh, that every, micro or, uh, every organism, let alone microorganism, every single living organism has a set of names. Uh, each one has a distinct uh, pair of names, uh, genus and species. So 
humans, for example, are the genus name for humans is Homo and the species name is Sapiens. We are Homo sapiens. An example of a bacteria which is commonly present throughout the environment worldwide is uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Genus Staphylococcus, species name aureus. So every living organism has two names. Uh, the genus name is the first name, the genus is always uh, the whole name, genus and species together, genus and species together are italicized or underlined. When they're written out, they're, uh, they're italicized or underlined, that's the proper way, and that's what you'll see in any book, textbook, literature, anything. The genus name is always capitalized and the species name is always lowercase. Here you see Escherichia, capitalized. E, uh, short form is E. coli. Escherichia is the genus coli. This is in italics. It could have been not in italics, but then it would need to be underlined. They are typically Latinized names. The name is derived sometimes from people who discover it or a particular characteristic of the organism, but it's Latinized uh, to give it a worldwide common kind of scientific approach. Um, the name sometimes describes characteristics. Here we have Staphylococcus aureus. This is a petri dish, agar petri dish. This is macroscopic. The dish is uh, about four inches across say 10 centimeters in diameter and it's agar. This happens to be blood agar, agar that has actual red blood cells in it. And the staphylococcus is, is growing. This is what we call a um, streak plate method of plating out the bacteria so that you actually get individual colonies growing which came from individual bacterial cells. I'll explain that to you later. But the name here is staphylococcus aureus. Aureus refers to the golden color of the colonies. And the clustering uh, staphylo refers to the clustered arrangement of the cells. When you look at them under the microscope at a very high power, under a light microscope, you see this kind of grape-like clusters. That's classic Staphylococcus aureus, round and grape-like clusters. Caucus means round. So you have um, um, these clustering round golden uh, name uh, adjectives in the being put together into the name Staphylococcus aureus. Now another example of a well-known bacteria is Escherichia coli. It honors the discoverer. I will stop at this point and mention, and students seem to appreciate this, um, the fact that in this course, if it's in written in red, and I'm not talking about the print that goes in the, uh, that is in a diagram, but what I've written in, okay? So if I've written it in on the slide and it's in red ink, you need to know it. If it's in black ink, it's okay. It's just there for your information. You don't have to know it. I wouldn't ask you. But the, the name Escherichia coli uh, honors the discoverer, discovered it many more than a century ago, Theodore Escherich, describes the bacteria coli, the second part of the name, the species name, describes, this, describes the bacteria's habitat, uh, the niche where it lives, which is the large intestine or colon. Notice that these are pink. And, that, and before they were, the uh, Staphylococcus aureus was a dark, deep violet or blue. And that's because of, they're using a particular stain here called the gram stain. And in this case, E. coli is gram negative and therefore is, comes out as pink or red. And uh, Staphylococcus aureus is gram positive and therefore is a deep blue, dark violet blue. After the first use of a scientific name, these genus and species name in a written document, then it can be abbreviated. And so if you're looking at something and it's the first appearance of that in the document, slide or whatever, then it'll be the full name, Staphylococcus aureus. But after that, the following after that first usage, it'll be abbreviated to S aureus. 
E. coli become uh, Escherichia coli becomes E. coli. All right. Now, everything out there, everything that's alive out there, can be divided into three domains. The three domains that all living things fall under are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The first two organisms have quite a bit in common and are called prokaryotes. The third one, are the third group, eukarya, the third domain, eukarya, these organisms are called eukaryotes. So you have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And the prokaryotes are simpler organisms and the eukaryotes are more complex. Bacteria and archaea under a microscope would probably not be easily distinguished from each other at all, but they do have some clear differences. These are um, prokaryotic organisms, and I'll describe in more detail soon what a prokaryote is. Everything else, our, everything else, every other living type of organisms is a eukaryote, falling under the domain eukarya. So that includes uh, all animals, all plants, algae, fungi, and protists or protozoa. All of these, all of which uh, are um, more, much more complex than bacteria and archaea, are eukaryotic organisms. The bacteria, which are prokaryotes, have a particular, and now I'm giving you characteristic features of the bacteria. The prokaryotes, the bacteria rather, are prokaryotic organisms and they have a particular molecule in their cell wall. They have a cell wall. It's not, it's not just that they have a cell membrane like we have cell membranes for our cells. They not only have a cell membrane, but outside of that they have a cell wall, very stiff structure. And in that cell wall they have a molecule called peptidoglycan. They divide by binary fission. Remember that cells in a mammalian organism, a eukaryotic organism, like human cells, divide by um, my, uh, mitosis. But these just double everything and split. Okay, it's a fairly simple kind of uh, mechanism, binary fission. They are involved in many kinds of things. That, in terms of the energy that they use, some can use photosynthesis, some can break down organic molecules, some can break down inorganic molecules. The key characteristics is binary peptidoglycan in the cell wall and division by binary fission. Back all prokaryotes, not just uh, uh, bacteria, but also archaea, members of these two domains, all prokaryotes do not have membrane bound subcellular structures like a human cell would have. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus that's surrounded by a membrane. They have mitochondria that are surrounded by membranes. They have uh, in plants, they're chloroplasts. In, in um, uh, their vacuoles, they're all sorts of, uh, there's the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus and eukaryotic cells. All of them are membrane bound organelles inside Pept uh, bacteria and archaea prokaryotes do not have any membrane bound or uh, organelles their nucleus is uh, they don't have a separate nucleus they have dna nuclear material but it's not surrounded by a membrane the uh, archaea are also prokaryotes they do not have peptidoglycan in their cell wall, and they are characteristically live in very extreme environments. They weren't, uh, in fact, recognized until uh, not that long ago, in the late 1900s, in the late uh, 1900s, uh, because they're so difficult to grow. They live in such extreme. They need really bizarre extreme environments, so, and some examples of prokaryotic uh, members of archaea include methanogens, which are able to produce methane, or extreme halophiles, which are able to live in really high saline solutions. There are some that can live in very high temperature uh, extremes of uh, temperature. These are called extreme thermophiles.
So they live uh, uh, in quite extreme environments. Now the eukaryotic organisms and these these bacteria and archaea are microorganisms. Now the eukaryotes, plants and animals are not microorganisms. Fungi, protists or protozoa and algae are. All of these are eukaryotic organisms. They have cells that are um, have uh, subcellular uh, uh, membrane bound organelles. These are more complex uh, uh, organisms. Uh, all, everything else besides uh, archaea and bacteria, the prokaryotes, falls under the eukaryotes. Fungi, an example, uh, are eukaryotes. Fungi are studied in microorganisms uh, in microbiology. They have a molecule uh, in their uh, cell wall called uh, chitin. Uh, they do have a cell wall outside of their cell membrane, and typically they use organic uh, chemicals, uh, organic molecules for for energy. They break down uh, dead material, so fungi will live on dead material typically. That's why you find them on the skin because the outer layer of uh, skin is dead. They find it on people's nails, on people's hair growing there. All of that is dead material. There are two uh, major types of fungi. One is multicellular and the other is unicellular. The multicellular one includes molds and mushrooms. They're multicellular consisting of masses of what's called a mycelium. Okay, the mycelium are many, many thin, long, hair-like filaments. Filaments, these long filaments are called hyphae, and together the whole mass is called a mycelium. Mycelia is plural. So the whole mass of it is a sing of a single one from a single organism is is a mycelium. And here you see, in fact, some examples. Here's uh, some uh, mold growing on a surface. Here, this is a mushroom, which is the uh, what you see when a mushroom pops up out of the earth. What you're seeing is a sexually reproductive uh, or, uh, structure. Most of the organism, most of this type of fungus, is down below in the earth in a much, much larger large mycelium that uh, can can uh, stretch out for a very large distance. Here you see a, f a fungal, a fungus growing on a person's toenail. And here you see a person brushing dandruff off their shoulder. Dandruff, in fact, is due, is caused by a fungal infection. There are unicellular fungi also. And these include all of the yeasts. And yeasts are uh, 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 used quite a bit in uh, production of uh, uh, bread and uh, cheese and um, um, uh, alcohol, uh, but they can also cause disease. Now, <clears throat> another type of microorganism that's a eukaryotic organism is, are the protists, and the older name, as I told you before, are protozoa. These are single-celled organisms. They are neither plant nor animal. Single-celled organism that's neither plant nor animal, but eukaryotic, that's a protozoa. Okay, they absorb surrounding organic chemicals or molecules from the environment, and that's what they live off. They, some are motile. They have, some have these, what are called pseudopods, like an amoeba would have pseudopods. Some have cilia or flagella. There are many uh, parasitic organisms that are, in fact, protozoa. A good example would be the organism that causes the disease malaria. Now, algae also falls on, under the study of microorganisms. We're not going to do much about algae at all with algae. These are eukaryotes. They do have cellulose in their cell walls. They carry out photosynthesis. They have a light fixing pigments. Uh, in this case, it's a green pigment, so it would probably be chlorophyll here. And they are able to produce molecular oxygen and organic compounds as they uh, as they live and uh, uh, reproduce.
The other thing, the other type of eukaryotic organism that's studied in microbiology are parasites. These can be very, very, very large. A tapeworm is a type of parasite. It can be as long as a meter. In the, uh, it can be a, a, a one meter long organism living in the uh, gut. Many, many, uh, and probably the vast majority of humans carry parasites uh, in their body, not necessarily in the gastrointestinal tract, but elsewhere as well. Yeah, parasites, we're, we're very lucky here uh, in North America. We have a controlled uh, water and food supply, uh, which is um, especially the water supply is particularly valuable because it's carefully controlled and uh, it's uh, prevented from uh, most of the time, not all the time, but almost all the time, uh, is in fact uh, organism free. Uh, parasites are eukaryotes. They are multicellular animals, in fact and typically are uh, different kinds of worms. And there are two major types, flatworms and roundworms. These are, the worms are called helminths. And there are flatworms and there are roundworms. Uh, and we'll get into that later, not in tremendous detail, but we will talk about it. They also have microscopic stages in their life cycle, which is why they're studied in microbiology. And not quite a few of them, the ones in the gut are identified uh, microscopically by examining feces from uh, samples and looking for eggs and because the eggs have a characteristic shape. Now the other type of organism which is studied microbiology and is extremely important as you well know now um, or should know is acellular. It has no cellular structure in fact, it's uh, difficult to actually say that it's alive because it cannot uh, really, it can survive, but it cannot uh, uh, maintain itself and reproduce itself unless it infects a host cell. And that these are viruses. These are acellular uh, uh, um, reproducing um uh, non-cellular, um, I, I, I'm trying to avoid calling them organisms because they're not. They have, a, they have a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA at their core. And that core is surrounded by a protein coat with a very simple repetitive type of structure. And sometimes, not in all viruses, the protein coat it itself is surrounded by a lipid uh, envelope. That envelope is made, uh, derived mostly from the cell that the virus had infected and then it, when it buds out it takes some of the cell membrane with it. So a characteristic virus would have nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat and may or may not have a lipid envelope. Um, a good example of a virus that has an envelope would be the influenza virus, influenza viruses, and also the coronaviruses. They only replicate when they are inside a living host cell. They either enter completely into the host cell and then um, shed the protein coat and releasing the DNA or RNA into the cell and then taking over the cell's machinery, or sometimes they they attach to the outside of the cell and inject in their DNA or RNA, and again, they take over the host cell machinery. So they need a host cell, and there are different large classes of viruses which infect animals or plants or bacteria. So there are viruses that can infect animal cells. These are animal viruses. This is a large you know, grouping of different viruses. There are plant viruses, which only infect plants. And there are bacteriophages. These are viruses that will infect bacteria. You can imagine how small these are if they can land on a bacteria and be, still be small compared to the bacterium. OK, so we're going to talk more about classification of microorganisms here. Um, should be, yeah, 
move on. So taxonomy is the science of classifying organisms in general, providing a universal name for a particular organism, provides a reference for helping identify organisms. Identification is key, especially when you're working with something which is microscopic in size. You need to have a good way of identifying it. You need to be able to classify uh, the organism First, you need to purify it and grow it in larger quantities so you can carry out tests to uh, help identify it. That's a, a key step. As you can see, this is a listing. It's in black ink, so it's just for your information. This shows the development of understanding of microorganisms, starting, well, organisms in general in terms of nomenclature, the 1700s plant and animal kingdoms, they used to call them kingdoms. Now we divide them into domains. Remember, three domains, bacteria, archaea, eukarya, or eukaryotes. Well, let's not belabor this. Let's move on. So the three domains that are recognized are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. The first two are prokaryotic organisms, and the third grouping are eukaryotic. And that third group includes protozoa here. Here's an example of an amoeba but also um, fungi and, um, and uh, animals and plants. They're all eukaryotic organisms. The cell wall, as I mentioned earlier in archaea, does not have peptidoglycan. In our E. coli, it does contain peptidoglycan. And uh, well, some organisms, some eukaryotic organisms have a cell wall and others do not. Our cells, for we are eukaryotic organisms. We do not have a cell wall around our cells. Um, plants all do, fungi do. There are certain types of characteristic lipids present in each of the different groups. I'm not going to get into that. There are differences uh, in terms of some amino acid, particularly the, which type of amino acid is used as the first amino acid when a protein in a protein chain when the protein is being made. Um, uh oh, I skipped ahead. I think we're okay. Let's leave it at that. Now, I just want to show you how the three domain system is uh, has been shown to have evolved from a universal, primordial, very primitive ancient organism and developed. And what we see here is that when you look at different organisms under bacteria or archaea or eukarya, you see how they seem to be derived from each other. It's important to understand that bacteria and archaea do have a lot in common in terms of their structure, but they are, they do also have distinct characteristics that make them quite obviously different. The thing about eukarya is that this is a much more complex uh, grouping of, of organisms. The cells are surrounded by a membrane they have a cell membrane and inside they have more organelles that are membrane bound, membrane bound structures. So they have a phospholipid membrane for the cell membrane, but also internal organelles, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, nuclear membrane, the nucleus, making up the nucleus, the, the uh, vacuoles, uh, you know, quite a few membrane bound or, uh, structures, organelles. It is believed for good reason that these organisms are derived from a simpler uh, organism which acquired uh, bacteria a, a long, long, very long time ago and incorporated them into the cells. So, and those bacteria, in fact, uh, are present in these cells as mitochondria. Okay, so the mitochondria, the energy producing organelle in eukaryotic cells uh, are seemingly, with good reason, we believe they are bacterially derived. Similarly, chloroplasts, which are the energy producing structures in plant cells, and plants are also eukarya, they also appear to be uh, derived from bacteria that started living in a symbiotic relationship with some other type of um, living thing. Fact is that 
mitochondria and chloroplasts, in fact, have many, many characteristics that make them very similar to bacteria. And I'm going to talk about that in uh, the next few slides. If we look at uh, eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells versus, I'm sorry, I'm going to highlight here. If we look at eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic mitochondria and chloroplasts, and if we look at particular characteristics like the DNA, we find that it is circular in prokaryotic cells. And when you look closely at mitochondria and chloroplasts, they also have DNA and it is also circular. Whereas in the eukaryotic cells in plants and animals and parasites and fungi and um, protozoa, uh, it's linear. What you don't perhaps know is that uh, mitochondria, and here you see a diagram of mitochondria from a eukaryotic cell. Okay. Obviously, this is magnified. And here's a diagram of a chloroplast. These are self-replicating structures. They have their own DNA. They code for their own um, uh, structures. They have genes that code for wh uh, what they're made of, and so they replicate separately from the rest of the cell. Uh, cells, different kinds of cells, at least in eukaryotes, have histones. Histones are a type of protein found in association with DNA. That is present in eukaryotic cells, but when you look at the DNA in mitochondria or in chloroplasts of plants, there is no, there are no histones. In prokaryotic cells, there are no histones. So again, the prokaryotic cells, the bacteria, let's stick with bacteria, forget archaea for now. The prokaryotic cells have another characteristic shared with mitochondria and chloroplasts of eukaryotic cell origin. The ribosomes, remember that ribosomes in eukaryotic cells, ribosomes are found in association with the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. This is the site of protein synthesis. Ribosomes have a particular sedimentation rate. When you put them on, um, on a fairly thick solution, fairly dense solution and centrifuge it, they will move down to a particular density level of sediment. That's how you measure sedimentation. They have an a, what's called ADS sedimentation rate, but in prokaryotic cells, it's 70 S and the exact same thing in eukaryotic organelles, mitochondria and chloroplast 70 S. When prokaryotic cells divide, they divide by my, binary fission. When mitochondria divide in a cell, they divide by binary fission and in eukaryotic organisms, the cells are dividing by mitosis. There are other characteristics which are the same in these two here, and they share the exact same characteristic with bacteria or prokaryotes and do not share them with eukaryotic organisms. So there are several other things which I haven't mentioned here. These clearly seem, it clearly seems the mitochondria and chloroplasts were derived in, uh, originally from a prokaryotic structure cells that was able to live together inside permanently, be developed into a permanent relationship with some other type of primitive cell to form eukaryotic cells. This idea of uh, some sort of um, bacteria that had chloroplasts in it, that had uh, light fixing pigments and started to live in symbiosis with another structure or another organism to form plants and also these, and by the way, plants also have mitochondria as you can see. So there should be an arrow here to the mitochondria. And also mitochondria that they're also derived from uh, bacteria. It's called the endosymbiotic theory. There's tremendous amounts of uh, evidence for, uh, in favor of it. Scientific names for bacteria, 
different bacteria come from all kinds of sources. I'm not going to get into this. Let's move on. Now, when we classify, when we do a taxonomic classification of organism, it's not just genus and species, but they can be further grouped into large groups of families, order, class, phylum. Don't worry about it. Genus and species, stick to that. And of course, remember that there are three domains, eukarya, bacteria, and it's not shown here, archaea. We won't talk a lot about archaea. None of them produce, to, to my knowledge, to anyone's knowledge, none of them can produce a disease in humans. So uh, human is not the kind of environment that they live in. They live in extreme environments. So we won't, I don't think we're going to be mentioning archaea much anymore. Okay, what defines a species, makes it unique from a different species? In eukaryotic organisms, they, a species is a group of organisms that can breed among themselves. Uh, they can breed with each other and produce um, a fertile offspring. In prokaryotes, we're talking about uh, population cells that have similar basic fundamental characteristics, biochemical and uh, structural and uh, genetic characteristics. In viruses, a uh, particular viral species, population of viruses that have similar characteristics, not by a particular niche. So species is one type. Now you can have subtypes or substrains of pro prokaryotes, They'll, they will differ somewhat and sometimes in an important way. So for there are many, many, many different substrains of E. coli, some of which can cause disease in humans and some cannot. Usually because they've acquired a gene that has a toxin from another organism. If it does cause a disease, it's because if you have a, a strain of uh, in this example, I'm talking about E. coli. If you have a strain of E. coli that does cause a disease, it's often because it acquired a gene. And we'll talk about that process later. It managed to pick up a gene that codes for a toxin. In terms of the domain eukarya, eukaryotic organisms, which include animals, plants, fungi, and protozoa or protista. These are all... Uh, um, Latinized forms of animal, plant, fungus, and protist. The basic animal organism, and we do study some, uh, well, we don't study plants and microorganisms but for microbiology, but animals we do in terms of parasites. So they are typically multicellular, do not have cell walls around their cells. And I will explain what this means later. They are chemoheterotrophic. This describes what kind of source they use for the carbon to build molecules, inorganic molecules, where their carbon comes from and where their energy comes from. So there are different types of trophs. There's chemo and photo, hetero and auto. We'll talk about that later. Plants are multicellular. They do have a cell wall with cellulose. Usually they're photoautotrophic. Fungi are all chemoheterotrophic. Unicellular, multicellular, I mentioned that. The unicellular ones are the yeasts. The cell wall contains chitin, a particular molecule called chitin. And uh, in terms of reproduction, they produce from spores or a fragment of the hyphae, the small filaments. Protista are single cell eukaryotic organisms that are neither plant nor animal. They don't fit anywhere here and they're single cell. That makes it a protist or a protozoa. Okay. <clears throat> Two types of prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria, can be subdivided further. I'm not going to get into further subdivisions right now. Do we know how to look things up and classify for all the known classifications for certain known organisms? Yes, there are manuals for that. You can look it up in Berge's manual. There's several different types of manuals that you can look up for all the key characteristics so that if you are looking, and believe me, this happens, you're trying, uh, science is trying to identify what a microorganism is that causes disease 
or that lives in a particular environment never seen before starts purifying it to get it just only that organism growing in culture and getting a lot of it so that you can do different types of tests on it and then looks it up to see if it's one of the known ones in uh, these manuals these are classic manuals of uh, bacteriology in general, how do we do identification? We typically use this kind of um, sort of a binary type of, um, I've forgotten the right term for this. It'll come to me eventually. But it's kind of a binary decision-making process where you do a test and then on the basis of that test, you look at another, you, you choose another type of test. And again, you have these, you know, two choices and that, that can include not necessarily in the order shown here differential staining tests that can differentiate one organism for another some examples of that which you uh, will learn about in the lab is uh, gram staining and acid fast staining biochemical tests looking for different bacterial enzyme activities DNA sequencing which we yes which we will do DNA sequencing which we won't and then just looking at morphological characteristics and as you do each test, then you decide, okay, we should do this other test and this test. And finally, they can identify if it's something that has been uh, described before, they can identify it in that way. Every different institution has its own kind of um, um, requisition form for uh, microbiology. And, uh, but the common characteristics would be the following. They would all have uh, date and time and doctor ordering, the physician ordering the test, who collected it, the patient ID number, very, very important. So all this kind of basic information would be on the requisition, typically from the card, the patient's um, identification card, medical uh, hospital card, and then uh, the typical kind of tests, but not just what tests have to be done, but what kind of sample is being sent down to the lab. So the source of the sample is always identified and uh, the appropriate type of sample is collected. In this case, the example here is uh, genital urinary uh, uh, sample from the, uh, it says VAG, vagina. Um, the test is uh, uh, the tests requested are um, ticked off. In this case, looking for um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember the name. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea, looking for gonococcal organisms. So it's a culture they're asking for, and then. Um, they actually have the report result here. You know, some of a lot of these things now are online, but the key idea is the identification up here, the source of specimen taken, the tests required, and then the report. This is something I'm not really going to get into in detail, but uh, there are actually many, many tests that are done in microbiology in this case what you have are multiple tests all these are different biochemical tests that can be done on a single sample this is called a uh, entero tube what you have is uh, different compartments with different biochemical reagents separated by wax barriers in between each one that's the white bar here in between each um, colored compartment and then a sterile sampling uh, wire is when the, this is opened uh, the sterile sampling wire is pulled out and uh, a sample of uh, feces is uh, taken and then the with the just the tip of the wire and then the wire is put back in and as it goes in it pierces and inoculates puts a sample of the bacteria into each different compartment and then the result the tube is uh, uh, sent to the, to the microbiology lab and cultured and you get different colored uh, responses depending upon whether it's positive or negative in the different compartments and that can be very quickly identified what the organism is 
by the result.